Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, if, if you put that recording now, everybody has to agree to it. So that makes it easy for you. Yeah, but, but if for whatever reason after the call, everyone, anyone has any issues or, or, or problems with it, please, um, we want to be respectful of, of folks' privacy and opinions. Let us know. Um, we have maybe we'll have a couple of more folks joining us, um, but we'll go ahead and kick things off to be respectful of, of everyone's time here that's joined us today. Um, first of all, welcome. Happy Tuesday, uh, July 11th, um, 2023. I say that more for, for me to remember what day it is, um, but hopefully everyone's having a good a good week so far and everyone had a great holiday um, week last week. Hopefully everyone is staying um, cool. There's some crazy heat waves going around the country. But um, again, welcome everyone to our July uh, Slauson space. Um, we can give a quick introduction to to what this is and and, and what we're going to be doing today. Um, before after going a couple going through a couple of ground rules, and then we'll do some quick introductions on our end. I'll quickly introduce our firm for those who have any questions, and then we'll get into the main topic of today, which is around different types of capital, which we can spend the first again twenty to thirty minutes discussing. Um, and then we can have the second half um, for any open Q and A, irrespective. Doesn't have to be about capital. Um, can be anything that's top of mind for you or your business. <clears throat> in terms of, in terms of a couple of ground rules. Um, so take space, make space. We we welcome everyone sharing their perspectives, and as well as learning from each other. So so be be respectful of people asking questions, and and hopefully everyone feels open and welcome to ask the questions that they have uh, for themselves. You can drop off as you please. We we don't expect you to join us for the entire entire hour. We know that uh, folks have different responsibilities in the morning, and then similarly, we welcome people being off camera if at all possible. Um, but understand if if you have different responsibilities that you need to to take care of that don't allow that. And and again, lastly, this is this is being recorded, and we're going to have it on our YouTube channel. Um, and then in terms of why we're doing this, so we're really doing it. Um, because um, I know that I am uh, at times tired of Googling things. And and as founders, we've heard that a couple of times that uh, there's not a, a lack of information, um, but there's a lack of personalized information. And sometimes you just want to ask a question to a human being and not chat GPT and, and hopefully get, get some sort of answer that can hopefully guide you in the right direction. So this is our firm's attempt to to um, connect with with folks um, with the founder community, so we hope that you find it useful. And again, today we're gonna we cover different topics each month. Um, so our last recording around building your team is is on our YouTube channel, and and this one around types of capital will go on as well. Uh, so we'll cover this for the first half, and then do a general Q and A. We'll do quick introductions on on our end. And then I'll quickly introduce our firm before getting into the topic of the day. Um, so I'll have my colleague, Eileen, introduce herself, and then I can take it over from there. Hi, everyone. My name is Eileen. I'm the platform manager at Slauson, so I work mostly on the post-investment side, um, working with the founders that we've invested in. Um, but yeah, just supporting Jesus with this series. I'm just excited to hear more about what you all are building. And I'll kick it back to Asus. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I see some other colleagues joining. Brittany, would you like to introduce yourself? Or if not, I can. Sure. Hi, my name is Brittany Crockett. I'm the head of platform at Slauson Co. Um, so I work very closely with Eileen on the post-investment side and supporting our founders to make sure they have all the resources to be successful. Nice to meet you. And then Mickey uh, Reynolds is also on the call, um, but she's commuting and Mickey is our head of platform. She just joined our team full time this month, um, primarily gonna be focusing on our accelerator called Friends and Family, which um, we can share more details about uh, in the Q and A if folks have any questions about that. But uh, we've done two cohorts uh, where 20 companies participated in a three, three month accelerator. And super excited to have Mickey on board with us full time to be um, spearheading that initiative. In terms Mickey's of our firm, Mickey's the head of programming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
We said head of platform. Oh, I'm sorry, head of oh, no. there you go. Um, looking at you and then talking about Mickey. Yeah. Uh, yeah, head of programming. Um, in terms of our firm, so briefly, Slauson and Co. were a $75 million pre-seed and seed fund rooted in economic inclusion. How that shows up to us initially is through our two primary areas of investment. Our B2B thesis is SMB tech, which we define as tools that support the next generation of small business owners. And then our consumer thesis is what we call culturally aligned consumer, which refers to companies building scalable products or services that are targeting overlooked or underserved customers and demographics. We're typically leading deals, investing anywhere between 250K up to 2 million. Oh, um, we have started investing at the top of 2021 and have since made 34 investments. So we have 34 portfolio companies. We're typically making about one new investment a month. Um, then our firm, the name comes from a, a prominent thoroughfare in Los Angeles that cuts across culturally rich, but systemically disenfranchised communities, cutting into one of the wealthiest communities of color in the nation. And we think about that journey that the street goes on from one end to the other to be representative of the journey we hope our founders take as they embark on building their their companies. Um, the ANCO part refers to the company we keep. This uh, includes, but it's not limited to our investors. So we're fortunate enough to have some of the big techs, Google, Meta, PayPal, Twitter, et cetera, notable late stage venture capital firms, um, individual venture capitalists, artists, operators, and founders who are excited about opening up their Rolodexes and supporting our founders whenever there is a challenge that they can intimately address. And again, I mentioned our, our friends and family accelerator headed by our head of programs, Mickey, and um, and we're primarily based in Los Angeles. We have an office off of Slauson. Um, I am actually the only outlier. I live in Oakland, California. But with that, um, just for future reference, if anyone ever wants to reach out to us, um, our, our website is the easiest way. Um, Eileen can probably drop the link. We ask for a couple of questions and we respond to all folks that reach out to us. Um, so if you or, or somebody that you know would want to connect with us, we always welcome it. And so with that, um, we can, I'm going to share my screen to get into the topic of today around, uh, actually, uh, I skipped introducing everyone on the call. So since it is uh, a bit of an intimate setting, we can have folks quickly introduce themselves. Um, and I uh, will share my screen so you can know what we would like for you to share. We'll, but we can keep it really brief. Um, you can see my screen. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, yeah, if you don't mind sharing just your name quickly, where you're calling from, one sentence description of your company, and then given the heat wave that is occurring across the nation, your favorite cold beverage, um, maybe Eileen, myself, and the Slauson team can type it into the chat, our cold favorite cold beverage. But in terms of, of having folks introduce themselves, we'll have just notarized and then Chris after just notarized. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alvaro Bautista. My company is Just Notarized. I'm calling from Downey, California. Uh, we are a secure in-person notary application. And favorite cold beverage on a cold day, let's go with ginger ale. Thank you. Thank you. And I have Chris next on my screen. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Temblador. Uh, founder of Vendor Match. I'm calling from South LA, uh, Slauson and Broadway. And uh, my business is a B2B platform that's connecting produce vendors to corner stores. And my favorite cold bridge on a hot day is just a cold glass of water with ice. Classic, love it. Um, and then next on my screen, I have Rolando. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, obviously, my name is Rolando Rigio. I'm calling from Los Angeles. Something that I want to do. And, um, uh, so at that time, I was also applying to business school. And you know, getting somebody talking. Okay. Uh, so the name of my company is Sunshine Upgrades. We do multi-sector solar, uh, but we're first uh, specializing in residential level solar. Uh, favorite beverage, I would agree with water or Jamaica. Awesome. Thank you. And then uh, Tori Ren, hopefully. 
It's all good. Hey, everybody. My name is Taran Xavier Moore, a co-founder of HBCUX. I'm calling from K-Town um, in Los Angeles. Um, HBCUX is a digital incubator and platform aimed at historically black university students. Um, and I, I'm going with Pellegrino um, for my cold beverage today. Thank you. And Tajwana? If you're able to come off mute, if not, if anyone isn't able to come off mute, we 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 get it. But we'll see if you're able to come off mute. And if not, we can have Luciano. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Luciano, if you don't mind. Thank yeah, you. hi. Awesome, thanks. I'm Luciano, CEO of LearnHouse. I'm calling in from uh, Sacramento, California. And we are building an autonomous learn coaching platform to help people with uh, lifelong learning. And uh, our favorite, my favorite cold beverage is, um, I'd just say maybe uh, fresh lemonade, <laughs> fresh squeezed lemonade with, you know, super big ice cubes. Cool. And then Shari, if you're able to come off mute. Hi everyone, good morning. Um Oh, we lost you. And Lupa is a personalized matchmaking system. Um, it's a dating platform that uses algorithm and no swiping. And my favorite cold beverage, I'm basic, y'all. I like a good cold glass of water. Nothing wrong with that. Thank you. Um, Frank? And if Frank isn't able to come off mute, we'll have Maragari. Oh, thank you. Yes. No, I'm uh, I'm off mute. Hi there, hi there, everybody. My name is Frank Estrada. I'm with MoneyFi out of Austin, Texas. So what we do is we're we're uh, an advanced matching platform for underserved entrepreneurs to match with lenders, credit partners, and education partners. So we're a funding and education platform to help uh, people get the right type of of capital to start their business and excel in it. But more importantly, the education portion of it to make sure that they have the ability to 10x their um, their portfolio whenever they do get the funds. So that's a little bit about me. I would say um, the, the favorite uh, beverage, I guess I would say Harito for me. Um, and that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Frank. And then last but certainly not least, we'll have Margarita if they're able to come off mute. Hi, everyone. My name is Margarita Sweet. I'm here in Los Angeles, California. My business is Visit My Child. We are a supervised visitation agency. We provide a supervised visitation or what's commonly known as monitored visitation for parents who are court ordered to be supervised while visiting their children. That's not custodial parents. And my favorite beverage is a sweet tea. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Um, now, you all have a little bit more context um, in terms of each other. Uh, if you want, this, no, not required any by any means, but if you want to share your LinkedIn's or socials or anything of that nature to connect with each other, you're welcome to do that. Um, and yeah, and hopefully, at least you now you know a little bit more about what each other does and can make you a little bit more open to, to sharing more about um, your, your backgrounds and your businesses as it relates to any topics we'll cover today. But without further ado, we'll spend the next, again, 15, 20 minutes talking about the different types of capital. And so just put a couple of slides together uh, to share our perspective on, on the topic, but would welcome folks uh, coming off mute, asking questions, one, to make this as conversational and, and ultimately as helpful as possible for you all. And so again, feel free to come off mute or, or raise your virtual hand. And, and we can kick kick things off. Um, I'll, I'll quickly describe all of these. And, and again, if anyone has any personal experiences with them, positive, negative, or just any general information that they wanna share that they think other founders in this space would, would um, benefit from learning, please, please share that. So the first one, and we also had a, a survey that folks filled out whenever they signed up for this. Um, folks were most comfortable or knowledgeable about venture capital and accelerators. So maybe I'll go over those um, in, in the briefest forms and then expand on some of the others. But when it comes to venture capital, um, that is 
the field of, of work that we do. Um, specifically at the earliest stages, we are investing dollars in exchange for direct equity ownership in a company. Um, and private capital actually blends a little bit with private equity in that um, in that private equity is venture capital. And hopefully I, I don't um, confuse you too much, but traditionally when someone refers to private equity, they are talking about very large firms that are usually um, using a lot of debt uh, or in finance terms leverage to buy companies. <clears throat> then they buy maybe buy, buy multiple companies and ultimately sell them to whether it's uh, another acquirer or a strategic company or they go public. But the difference is that private equities are private equity firms are looking for very mature businesses, very typically very large businesses. Whereas venture capital, you have everything from early stage to late stage, and, and there's typically more risk involved. Um, and typically in exchange for that increased risk, you're taking more ownership than a private equity company would. Um, under, venture, under venture capital, I'm including angel investors. I know some folks asked about the difference. When you think about an angel investor, the main difference between that and a venture capital firm, which we are, is typically angel investors are um, using their own personal capital to make investments. They don't have to answer to anybody but themselves, um, whereas a venture capital firm is actually managing uh, effectively other people's money. We're, we're professional money managers, if you will, where people have um, invested in our fund with, with an, an assumption of us returning their capital plus more to them at a certain point in time. Whereas angel investors, their, their time horizons for expecting a return and, and their risk tolerance or preferences are basically up to the individual person or maybe a family sometimes. But venture capital, um, if you're thinking about a, a venture capital firm, that's an actual formal organization with working professionals. An angel might just be someone who does it on the side um, as, as a hobby, if you will. But that's that's some of the the distinctions there. Maybe I'll pause to see if there's any questions around venture capital or angel investors or, or even private equity for that matter. Hi, this is Luciano. Just a quick question: um, Are you seeing are you seeing any um, like new? I, I know, kind of like the definition of institutional investor. I think was changed in Europe. I, do you see anything kind of happening in US law kind of around that space, kind of redefining who can be, quote, an investor? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, I, I didn't, I'm not hearing anything around institutional investor, but I, I think the, the term that people use is an accredited investor. So so there, there is a lot of changes happening um, recently. Uh, so for example, I think it was two years ago, the government changed the definition of an accredited investor. And so what that means is typically an angel investor has to be an accredited investor in order for them to legally make an investment in a private company. And so um, traditionally the, the, the um, things that you, the requirements that you had to meet before this change was that you had to have over a million dollars in assets, or I think it was two or 300 in income, uh, two, two or $300,000 in, in household income they've included a couple of other ways for somebody to be an accredited investor. I think there's a couple of tests now, or if you work for a certain type of um, investment organization, you are by default um, an accredited investor, and therefore you can make investments in private companies if you wanted to a, a, as an angel. So so to answer your question, there, there are those changes, and, and they're also trying to do some more changes to increase the definition and who can be an accredited investor, um, which will make them um, able to make investments into to private companies like startups. So that's definitely one worth watching, um, but I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Alrighty, so with the next two there, they're somewhat similar and related, and, and this is where there, there's there's not a clear definition or 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 a black and white um, way to look at it, but generally speaking, accelerators like the one that we have, 
is a program where um, oftentimes they are giving you some sort of capital coupled with mentorship that's through um, a definite period of time, let's call it three months, <clears throat> where you're going through some sort of a curriculum and they are taking equity ownership in your company. Um, but typically it, it's kind of a misnomer, well, not a misnomer, it typically the definition is in the name in terms of it's an accelerator program is meant to accelerate your business um, more often than not, but not always you already have an actual business, an actual product that you can have, which you then accelerate during the program, um, where it's the difference between an incubator and a studio an incubator, um, you're incubating an idea potentially. You're you're actually it, it's just you. Maybe you have a team, and you are brainstorming. You're coming up with a potential idea, and 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 you're still getting some sort of capital and hopefully some resources from an organization to start the com <clears throat> to start the company, and then and then you are. Um, and then you're using those resources to eventually start uh, start and grow the company. Similarly with a studio, um, some venture firms have uh, studios or organizations are venture studios where again, it's just an idea, a team, and they are building a company from scratch effectively. They don't already have an idea built. They don't have a product built. And again, they're taking capital for, for ownership typically, <clears throat> but even earlier than an accelerator. Um, there's lots of accelerators out, accelerators out there now. We have ours called Friends and Family. There's a number of them now. Um, and then incubators and studios, there are not as much in my opinion, um, but are increasingly growing in popularity and um, are, are interesting structures to look at. If, if you typically, um, some of the studios are, are, are attached to like two-time founders and things of that nature who, who want to who've already built a company, sold the company and want to do it in some sort of serial uh, fashion. But let me pause there to see if there's any questions around accelerators or, or incubators and studios. Uh, I have a quick question. Please. So it, I could be wildly wrong with the speculation, but uh, it seems like to me, you know, I'm high school class of 2012. So got to experience, you know, like the, 08 recession while in high school and seeing how that impacted businesses and then seeing how the pandemic has impacted businesses. I'm perceiving that there's a lot more incubators and accelerators than I've seen in the past years. And is there a reason why this is potentially being stimulated or is it just more noticeable because I'm in this space now, but it looks like to me that there's a lot more stimulus for small companies especially tech companies and climate tech companies, considering, you know, the IRA program and things of that sense. Yeah. Um, I, I can share some perspective and then I know Mickey is, is commuting, but she's been in the space and has a plethora of experience. If she wants to share anything, she, she can. Um, I think it's part of, it's partly a couple of different factors that are contributing to the increase in, in the number of these types of programs a part of it is just the amount of capital that's been devoted and directed towards venture capital. And so whenever you have so much attention and energy being driven that way because of the um, exciting stories in the media and actually from financial returns that you saw from, call it the early, late, um, call it late, well, sorry, early 20 teens in terms of Uber and Airbnb and some of these companies you you saw them, um, a lot of those were products of incubators or accelerators. And so as companies, uh, as um, institutions were putting more money into venture capital, uh, eventually it rolled up into the earliest stages. And that's whenever you saw more and more programs being created or certain programs growing um, in, in size, in the amount of dollars they're investing. And so typically there's a, a crowding in whenever um, it's like the big tech competing a, a product uh, of like Instagram creating something that they're copying from somebody else. Somebody wants to do something because they think that they, sh they should be doing it because their competitors are doing it. And so that creates a lot of competition. Hopefully, comp generally speaking, competition is good for, for consumers or, or founders. And that increased competition makes more opportunities happen for 
for, for innovators like yourselves. And therefore now there are, I'm sure there's like a formal study. And I think I would agree with you that there's more now. Um, but Mickey, if you're off, if you can come off mute and want to share any perspective, feel free. If not, I think the answer is yes, there's more now. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Jesus. I think Rolando also brought up a really interesting point that during economic downturns, we, I think we in general see an increase in the creation of companies. And that's where a lot of wild innovation happens, um, sometimes out of necessity because people are, you know, jobs are being lost and you have to create some sort of means. Um, but it's also there's opportunities created in those places. So I think that's maybe another reason why we're seeing more companies being started, uh, more need to support those types of companies. Um, but I think in particular in the last few years, there's been really this demand to try and close the gap when it comes to the racial um, and gender inequities uh, with, when it comes to investing in startups. And so you've seen large corporations like Amazon um, and Google have launched initiatives that are specifically supporting uh, Latino and Black startup founders. Uh, you saw uh, JP Morgan partner with Techstars um, to infuse, I think it's $80 million in capital um, to support underrepresented founders. So you're starting to see a lot more programs and initiatives and support, particularly supporting um, underrepresented founders. Um, and I think it's also a byproduct of you being in the space, you're seeing more of this, you're, you're looking for things that can support the type of work that you're doing. Thank you. A lot more is happening, a lot is happening and a lot more should and needs to happen. Um, uh, but appreciate the question. So the next bullet is around crowdfunding. This is actually one where a lot of folks were also familiar with. So whenever we talk about crowdfunding, these are the platforms. There are a number of them out there now. I'll just list a few, um, Republic, WeFunder, StartEngine, um, even Kickstarter. They're, they're basically a platform that allows individuals to collect money from anyone effectively uh, in order to fund their idea or their company. And so the, the, each platform has different uh, requirements um, in terms of amount that they charge or percentage that they take from, from your fundraise. Um, and in, in terms of why one would do this, there's also a, num a different number of, of reasons why you would do this. Sometimes it might be easier to raise capital depending on how much you want to raise in this form from from individuals uh, in your community or just the community at large sometimes people use that as a way to create um, as a marketing mechanism to create more interest about their business because now you have an actual investor let's say if you're you have a physical product that you can buy in the store now you have somebody who's an investor that can actually purchase your product and that's gonna make them more of an evangelist um, and help work, serve as a, as a marketing channel for you to sell more products because you have more investors. Um, there Again, there are pros and cons, but and then there's a number of platforms there. I think even to the earlier point, I think there's a, an increased number of crowdfunding platforms now um, than there have been before which I think is good. There's even crowd investing or crowdfunding platforms for, for raising debt. So it doesn't have to be equity. Um, there are now some platforms for raising um, loans from um, one that comes to mind is SMBX. So a small business in your local neighborhood, local neighborhood might raise um, bonds, uh, debt um, from, from the local community. Um, I purchased some bonds from there. I've also participated in WeFunders and Republic. So big fan of, of the crowdfunding and crowd investing movement. But I think there's a question. Um, so I want to pause for that. So quick question. Um, in terms of the crowdfunding space, is there any particular guidelines and those that you would have us to look out for? Like are some better than others and what would make one better than the other? Yeah, well, I think the, well, one, I would highly recommend you talking to people who have done a successful campaign on the different programs. Um, I know that I've, I've heard mixed reviews in terms of some people saying that the platforms offered them more than they actually received. So so definitely do your diligence in talking to people who have had a, a successful campaign on those platforms. 
Um, there are different requirements for each one. So for example, I know some have a certain revenue threshold, whereas others don't. So that would depend on where your business is and, and how much you're looking to raise. So to the earlier question around changes that have happened, I was mentioning the change in the institutional investor side. I'm sorry, sorry, accredited investor side there. Um, I think a while ago now, maybe three or four years, they the um, law changed to where before it was, you could raise roughly around a million dollars from crowd investing platforms and now it's 5 million. So maybe questions if you were interviewing some of these platforms is, how, is what's the average amount that people raise from? What are their fees like? Um, what do they view as the main benefits from these platforms? So it, it really depends on where your business is at because some platform might not make sense for you depending on the geography, the sector um, that you're operating in. But I would absolutely recommend talking to a founder who's participated in, in, a, in a campaign on whatever platform you're considering. Thank you. And I apologize that I couldn't unmute earlier. No worries at all. <clears throat> Welcome. So we'll we'll keep moving with, with some of these other forms of, of types of capital. So the next one is traditional loans. This one is just debt. Um, it, it sounds pretty basic, but it can actually get pretty complicated. Um, I think the finance industry is great at overcomplicating things, For unfortunately. Um, so this is where a couple of asterisks here. You can have mezzanine, senior, secured, unsecured, revolving uh, credit lines. At the end of the day, you are borrowing some money and then you're paying it back um, in a certain point in time at a certain interest. And so, yeah, again, people can get really creative depending on, on the stage and size of your company, but this is just borrowing money. Similarly with venture debt, it's the same concept. However, with venture debt, um, these um, organizations are more risk tolerant. So they are able to actually give loans out effectively to startups. Now that might sound risky um, because it is, um, and typically the interest rates are higher and, and there's other pieces of the transaction that would make the deal um, enticing for a venture debt investor. One example is Sometimes they include this thing called a warrants. All a warrant is is an option for them to, in the future, have uh, buy equity ownership. So they're basically, if somebody, um, for example, is was an early if a venture debt firm was an early investor in Facebook, they might have lent them some money, but they said, and if at if at any point in the future we have the option to buy some stock in your company, and let's say you know Facebook goes public and they actually execute that, they are able to make a much higher return than they would just by the interest rate that they are charging. So there's some smaller shops or, or some, some small organizations that are offering venture debt. Um, there are typically requ certain requirements in terms of how much cash you have to have in the bank and how long you have to have been around, et cetera. But it is an option for, for early stage um, founders. Maybe I'll stop there or take a quick pause on traditional loans or venture debt to see if anyone has any any questions. If not, uh, we'll move on to grants, which are the best type uh, the best type of capital, maybe because it's the cheapest. Um, I mean, this there there can be different uh, ways that this looks like. It can be a grant from the government. It can be a grant from a, a private organization. It can be from a philanthropic organization. Um, grants are are the uh, cheapest forms of capital, but that doesn't mean they're the easiest form to access. There's there's typically um, a, a lot of folks also wanting that same grant, or there's maybe some uh, reporting requirements attached to getting the capital. Um, so you want to be careful and understand what are the strings that are attached to to, to that grant before before taking it or before applying but if you have the option to to use utilize some grant capital for your business obviously that, that makes um that goes a long way because you don't have to pay it back and then this last bullet i call the unique types um they they're not necessarily some of them are new some of them have been around they just weren't as popular but this is where things are 
more creative. Um, what I mean by that is certain organizations or investment firms are offering revenue uh, share agreements or, or profit share agreements. There's one called Space from a, an organization that we are uh, familiar with and co-investors um, of called Collab Capital. They, I think theirs is based off of profit. So basically saying at any point in the future, um, you can pay us back a percentage of your profit up to a certain um, amount. And that can actually, you can pay back some of the equity that we own. So the, the difference between that and revenue is instead of profit, obviously being after expenses and costs is that they do it off of the revenue that you're generating. Um, and it can typically, you want to make sure that you're understanding them um, completely so that you know that they're not being extremely extractive for, for what you're, what you're looking for. And then there's other unique ones. Again, this is a, a newer organization, but they're saying, we're going to take a part of your income, you as an individual, uh, in exchange for giving you some sort of capital. Um, there's an organization called Chizos, but there's um, a small number of them, but, but they're also growing. I think pe people are getting creative with um, making investments either into people or organizations, particularly at the early stage. I'm a big proponent of more um, unique ways for people to find access to capital, but there, there are increasingly others that are popping up. So if anyone has any others that I may have missed, I know I definitely missed some, but I took a quick pause to see if there's any comments or questions on any of these um, that I shared. Uh, I have a question slash suggestion. Please. Um, for one, I'm I'm definitely learning a lot about, you know, the financial space and just the many forms. These are all at the end of the day, like products. And when you look at them as such, they make become much easier to understand. Do you guys happen to have like a, a infographic with like visuals and like this looks like this and kind of manifesting if it was like a hundred thousand, so it's usually easier to comprehend. I for one, if you do have one. I would really like it. If you don't, that would be super useful. Um, <clears throat> now, is there a list in which you would recommend? I'm, I'm pretty sure that there isn't like a, you know, this path is everybody's path, but almost like a list of priorities or a list of which one should go about checking for different forms of capital or debt. So there are some charts out there. We don't have one that we've made that we can share at this moment in time. There are some charts that show, generally speaking, the life cycle of a company um, from its inception to IPO, if you will. Um, and so typically, a lot of these, it might look like an overwhelming number of options and, and they are products, financial products, like you said. Typically, when it comes down, it, it comes down to... Um, um, stage of the company. So typically you're going to be looking at venture capital um, or grants if you can find it a along with incubators and studios and accelerators. You don't always have to go through an accelerator or an incubator, um, but that's those are typically at the earliest stages, probably followed by crowdfunding. And then increasingly as you're moving along in your business's journey, hopefully you're growing, generating higher revenues, you're able to actually qualify for more loans, et cetera. And then eventually, um, depending on the stage of your business, you might go public. And that might mean that you have institutional um, public investors that are investing in your company, which means a whole lot of different things. Um, but generally speaking, the majority of these products are skewed towards early stage. And then as your company grows in maturity, that there in means that it's less risky because you have more revenues, you might have more assets, which might qualify you for more venture, uh, sorry, for more debt products and, and hopefully at, at a cheaper cost. Because one of my next points in my next slide is not all of these um, cost the same. And, and I, cost is in quotation marks because um, you, it's hard to compare uh, a loan product that's charging you five or 10% interest rate with venture capital, which is taking 10 or 20% of your company, um, there is a cost that you have to either pay back or a cost to you in terms of 
literally ownership decision making. Um, you now have a board um, seat that's been taken up by somebody else. So, anyways, we can probably look for some of the graphics and maybe we can include those in in the the notes in the YouTube channel. Um, oh, and if we can't find a good one, maybe we'll we'll consider putting something together. But yeah, the easy way to think about it is depending on the stage of, and as you grow and mature, you're able to access different types of, of financial products. Awesome, thank you for the question. So I know we're coming up on time and I wanna leave um, some time for just general Q&A. <clears throat> a couple of quick high level thoughts. So exactly to the earlier point that we were just discussing, you wanna consider how much you need and what it would be used for. Um, because again, they all come with different costs and, and strings attached effectively. So if you need working capital, which just means, hey, I need to, um, I need to buy a machine or I need to um, expand to a new venue or location or I need to buy some more product um, versus I need to hire a team to build this app. Um, all of those have different dollars that you need to to raise um, and you and therefore you shouldn't unnecessarily use the wrong product for for that um, that necessity. So really think about how much do you need, um, what is it going to get you, and and where is the best use of that coming from. Um, and then the best use might not be the easiest um, channel to to get it from. So you want to make sure that you're thinking about it strategically. Um, this next point just accentuates, um, this is probably more so for the private equity and venture capital whenever someone is actually taking an ownership in your company, as opposed to just offering you a debt product. But a bad investor can really um, have a lasting impact on your company in terms of, especially at the earliest stages, they're going to be around for many years to come. And so it might, in, in an extreme case where you only have one, hopefully you have multiple um, folks that are that are wanting to work with you. Um, and but it, but if you don't, and you have to choose one, you want to make sure that you're choosing it from the right investor because choosing it from the wrong investor um, can have can have big implications for you in the company. And and one easy way to figure out if they're a good or a bad investor is by talking to um, other people that they've invested in before. And this third point really um, is something that we share with our founders, uh, especially at the early stages, whenever you are looking for equity investors, whether that's venture capital or, or other forms of equity investments. It's about relationship building. Um, a, a, taking out a debt product, a, a loan from a, a bank or an organization, typically they're not, they don't care a ton about what you're building or, or who you are or your background. They care about your credit score and how much revenue you generated and how much assets you have and if they can use it as collateral, et cetera. So at the earliest stages and particularly, it's really um, advisable to be thinking about fostering your relationships as opposed to, hey, it's a trend, as opposed to thinking about it as a transaction um, because at the earliest stages, it's, it's less a transaction and, and more a relationship because you're gonna be working together for many years to come. In terms of how to how to hopefully find the right types of investors, um, if there are companies that are similar to yours in terms of sector or or industry, um, maybe look for some of those companies and then research who invested in those companies to see if those are investors that you should have um, conversations with and start to build um, relationships with, so that they can be potential partners for you or um, share names of other individuals that, that maybe you should connect with. And then lastly, whenever you are um, either researching or having a conversation with an investor, these are just a, a list of a couple of questions that it would be worthwhile for you to know to hopefully save your time and, and theirs. See if there are any what we call red lines or things that they don't invest in. Um, so you might have an you might be having a, a company that in an industry that that investor might not invest in. Um, one example might be like medical devices. A, a firm might say, I don't invest in medical devices, not because they don't like them, but just because that's not what they focus on. And so if you're a medical device company, it's probably not somebody that you should have on your list. 
so researching what stage they're investing in. When I, when I talk about private equity or even venture capital, there's a wide range of what that means in terms of, so I explained we do pre-seed and seed, um, but there are other investors that only focus on series A. There's some that do anything after series A and those checks, uh, are, those, the check sizes are much bigger for those um, firms and, and what they ask for and require from, from companies from a revenue or team perspective is much different than, than, than we would be looking for. So asking about how much they invest, um, what is their target ownership if they have any, making sure you're both aligned on long-term vision. <clears throat> so if you are taking capital from a venture capital firm, um, typically more often than not, they are expecting to exit at some point in the future. That exit should be one that is significantly meaningful for them and that firm. So as a quick example, we're, our, our first fund that we're deploying capital from right now is a $75 million firm. And so we are expecting and are, are aiming for uh, returning capital that are multiples of $75 million. And so um, for us investing in a company that might return, that might sell for one or two or, or even five or $10 million, uh, while that might be a great outcome for that individual or, or that team, um, for a firm of our size, that might not be the case. Whereas if it's a, if we were a venture firm of, of a couple of million dollars, an exit of, of $10 million in a company they invested in, that might actually be really meaningful. So you want to make sure that your expectations are aligned with your investor's expectation, understand how they support companies once they make the investment, if they get involved at all, um, and then lastly, understand their process so that you don't, um, yeah, we, we share, um, a presentation with folks who, who, who submit their information with us. Maybe we can drop that link, um, in the chat, Eileen, please, in terms of our process, but you want to ask what their process and timeline is so that you, um, have some sort of transparency and, and aren't wasting your time, um, because that wouldn't be a good a good use of your time where you, where you, as you could be using that time to build the company. I'll pause here on any, if there's any questions on anything that I've shared on this slide. Wonderful. Well, I have a question. Please, um, we have two questions. Well, Thank you. What are your thoughts on grant writers? Um, my quick thoughts are they can obviously be very helpful. Um, I think you want one, obviously work with a very experienced grant writer. Um, two, I don't know if they're, the, it, it really depends on the stage of the, business, I think. So again, if you think you're going to qualify for a substantial grant that's going to be meaningful for you where you are in this current stage of the company and you are able to find, I feel like to me, grant writing might be similar to like even finding a venture capital firm that is right for you. Not all grant writers are the same. Um, there are so many different types of grants out there. I do think that it's like almost its own science so so it's probably worthwhile getting some someone to support you with it but I, but from my understanding of, of the grant writing process you you want to have you can benefit from their expertise but you really want the right type of expertise that I don't think all grant writers are have the same knowledge and skill set because there's so many types of grants out there there's philanthropic grants there's government grants so yeah if anyone else has any experience with with any grant writers, uh, please please feel free to share. Yeah, uh, Chris. Hey, Suze, in terms of relationship building, um, what would you advise for early stage companies in terms of building relationships with either VCs or even angel investors? Yeah, so, I think the the first step is figuring out who you want to build a relationship with. And so again, a lot of the research that that I shared here 
some of this information you can you should be able to hopefully get from their websites or things that they publish online or through actual conversations with them but hopefully through some sort of um online publications or, or mediums and then once you have excuse me that list of of firms that you do want to establish a relationship with i think the earlier you do it the better off you'll be um by that i mean ideally you're not doing it once you're actively fundraising, not that you won't get investment from them once you start fundraising, but just to put into perspective for, for our firm, um, we're making about one new investment a month on average, and we get dozens of pitches on a weekly basis. And the majority of those 90 plus percent, uh, 90 plus percent of those are companies that are actively fundraising right now, which, and basically they're saying, do you want to invest or not? Yes or no. And, and we evaluate them and, and we, we, we have engage uh, with some of them, but um, it would behoove you and us to have a relationship earlier on so that whenever you are actually fundraising, it's, Hey, it's less, this is the first time you're hearing from me. I have no idea what you're building. I have no idea who you are. And so it, it, when, when it comes down to building a relationship, you um, want to think about it much like you will build the relationship with anybody in, in terms of, I mean, we have events that we host. Um, we had one last month for uh, for LA Tech Week. Um, we have these. Uh, so I'm just giving you one example for, for how somebody could start to build a relationship with us. Um, not that I'm saying you have to do it this way, but once you're getting on people's radar, having the um, f- folks that know the firm introduce you to them to just have a conversation, maybe to ask for feedback about your idea or about your business or something that you're, some challenge that you're facing at that moment in time, and then keeping in touch. I think once you've established some sort of initial relationship, um, oftentimes, I I know I do get added to a lot of investor um, updates, uh, which get sent out maybe once a month or once a quarter. And that's a very passive way to, for you to continue to build excitement with, um, or not build excitement, but just show what you're building to the different people that are on that, that mailing list. Um, and then hopefully you're, you're checking in maybe once a quarter or something of that nature. So that whenever you are actually fundraising, again, it's less, Hey, you have no idea who I am or what I'm building. This is the first time that you're hearing from me. I'm pitching you. Do you want to invest or not? And again, that's the norm, which which is what, which is how we, um, which is a lot of the folks that reach out to us. But um, I've I've seen and 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 we advise our founders to hopefully start building relationships earlier so that it's less um, the conversation much moves much smoother whenever it's somebody who knows you and knows about your company um, and has continually been following it for some time as opposed to this is the first time that I'm hearing about it and I have to make a decision right now based on the limited information that I have. So uh, it's, there's no run perfect way, but that's a couple of examples of, of how you could start to build a relationship. Thank you. Uh, I know we have about five minutes left. Oh, I think someone had a question. Can you speak to the concept of gift capital? This was mentioned during a conference, and I don't want to assume it to be as simple as it sounds, because even grants have strings attached. Um, I'm not sure if I've heard of gift capital, to be honest. I am assuming that that's something that's separate from a grant, in that it's just a gift um, of some sort that someone provided you, whereas if it's a grant, typically there's some sort of... um, uh, legal tax com- um, implication attached to it. So typically it, it might be a philanthropy that's giving a grant where they are using it as part of their mandated um, amount of capital that they have to to give to organizations on a yearly basis. Whereas a gift um, is something that somebody's just giving you, they're not going to uh, uh, mention it or, or put it down on their tax um, on their organization's tax filings. The the implication, it, it, the only one that I can think of immediately is just from a, um, inc- uh, from a tax perspective. If you receive a gift, it's going to be taxed um, likely at a different rate or the same rate that you would any sort of general income. 
So yeah, I don't think I'm super aware of that, but that's my quick reaction to, to give capital. Uh, we have another question. Uh, or is, you didn't uh, just, I uh, just notarized, I didn't catch your name. Yeah. Sorry about that. My name is Alvaro. Alvaro. I'm looking at your accelerator and it shows that it started in January. It goes for, was it like three months? When is the next one or when does the application open for, for us to try to be part of that next accelerator program? I'm sure, Mickey, I'm not sure if you're able to come off mute if you want to share any, any high level thoughts. That is a great question. We don't have any details to share just yet, um, but I would keep an eye out um, on our socials for when we do make the announcement. Uh, it will probably be within the next few months that we'll announce the next cohort uh, and the program will run in early 2024. So just keep your eyes peeled. Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rolando. Well, one question regarding venture debt was this idea of somebody, I've seen Lacey, for example, say you, we get like 3%, you get X amount of funds, you can buy back 1.5% of the equity we bought from you. Um, but the other thing too, I was interested, let's say if somebody takes 20% of equity, what does that look like in terms of quote unquote, the bottom lines in your financials? Are you giving 20% of revenue, profit? Like, what is it that they actually, they being the venture uh, capitalist or investor wants in exchange for that equity? Yeah, so the slight difference in the two things that you mentioned, so with like Lacey or any, I would put that in under like the unique category where you can buy back some equity there's a thing called self-liquidating equity, which is kind of what you're talking about. Um, that's, that's what it sounds like in terms of you are taking capital and buying back some of the ownership that that organization has. Where that capital comes from might be stipulated in the agreement itself, i.e. it might be from the revenue, it might be from the profits, they might not care where it comes from. It might be a gift that someone gave you all of a sudden. Um, the, the difference with venture capital is if we own a company that's, we if we own 20% of a company um, and we typically aim to own 10 to 15, so 20 would be on the higher end. Uh, but if a company owns 20%, if a venture capital firm owns 20% of your company, they're hoping that at some point in the future, there is an exit event where they're going to receive 20% of that transaction value. As a simple um, example, if we own 20% of a company that eventually <clears throat> goes to become a billion dollar um, business that and sells or goes public at that amount and we sell our ownership, we then have $200 million in proceeds that we, are gen that we have generated from that transaction. Um, so that's typically coming from an, an exit event. Again, exit event, the two typical ones are somebody acquiring you um, or you going public. Um, there's a third, which is like secondary sales, um, which is somebody else basically buying your shares. But the first two are the most common ones. And it's 20% of that transaction that the owners would, would benefit from. Um, so that's typically more the venture capital um, private equity model, as opposed to some of these unique structures. Thank you. And I think we have one last question. Um... It, so if we are pre-launch and we're dealing in tech in a SaaS business, where would you say the first place is like, what would a roadmap in a perfect world look like in terms of funding? Yeah. I mean, if, if you're, if you're at an, are you at an idea stage or, or not? Are you pre-product? Pre-product. So if you're pre-product, um, you could fall into the category of um, friends and family or angel investors or, or an incubator. Um, so some combination of those three could be where you net out 
if you want to go down the venture capital path, you could, um, but going down that venture capital path means that you're expecting, typically you're expecting the, that this company grows to be, or you're going to operate in, 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 in a multi-billion dollar industry and market, and you want to grow a company to be that size. Um, but if you're not wanting to go down the venture capital route, then uh, it depends on the type of business that you're um, operating in, um, meaning you want to grow and you're going to grow because you're going to borrow certain loans after you reach a certain size. Um, but at the earliest stages, I, it would, I would say it would be some combination of friends and family, angel investment, accelerators, or venture capital, if venture capital is a route that you want to go down. Um, now, the and we don't we're, we're over time unfortunately but if you're um in terms of framing a successful fundraise we'll actually have another one of our sauce and spaces around that but if you want to um think about how to have a fundraise at the earliest stages then it comes down to a little bit of what we talked about in this conversation of how much are you building sorry how much are you raising what are you going to use it for and a pitch deck and having a data room and, and there's a, a, a process through which you would want to structure your fundraise so that you're able to raise the, whatever amount of capital that you think you would need to take you to the next stage of growth that that you would want to get to um, depending on again if you're going down a venture venture capital path uh, or not so hopefully that gives you a little bit of, of color yes thank you wonderful well, thanks everyone for for joining and, and for those who stayed on for the entire hour. Um, we do these every month, second Tuesday of the month. So keep an eye out on our socials for for other um, for the next one, or share with other folks that you think might benefit from it. And we'll also be posting it on our YouTube. So have a great rest of your day and week. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye.